Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Katie, and the Michigan Kirtland's warbler perched next to me is Ellen. I suppose I am a cute little bird. (laughs) The cutest? Aw. (laughs) Fun fact, warblers like to winter in the Bahamas, which also sounds damn good to me. Yeah, I suddenly think I might be a warbler too. Right? Jeez. And conveniently, I'm a bird again, so let's just fly into the Phoenix flashback. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 30, Grop and the corresponding film scenes. Hagrid's familial discovery spells nothing but trouble for the trio. Harry agrees to help without giving any thought to what that might entail. Hermione never thought she'd see the day when she actually wished for her biggest worry to be a dragon. Ron inspires the Gryffindors to rewrite some less-than-complimentary lyrics by turning into an utter badass on the Quidditch pitch. And we all know giants aren't the smartest, but who knew they were at the the thwarted-by-a-rope-around-the-waist level of intelligence? During episode 173, our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on the changes in meeting Grop from book to movie? Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. How do I feel about them switching up how they met Gorp in the book versus the movies? I'm a little upset behind it only because the reasoning leads to them not putting Quidditch in this movie at all and moving shit around to other movies that happen in this one doesn't make sense. But... I do like the scene. It was cute with the little bicycle bell handles and how Hermione was treating them. I like that a lot, but they got it wrong. Hey guys, Jackson here. So what do I think of the changes of Grop from book to movie? Well, honestly, I didn't mind it too much. I mean, there wasn't a heap of changes. There was mostly just the way it was done and who actually met Grob. So, you know, not gigantic changes in this one. Didn't really mind them. Although I would have liked to uh, (laughs) hear Hagrid say to Grob, meet (laughs) Hermie. Oh, God, Hermie. Poor Hermione, reduced to that. But nah, no, it was all right. I did like her being firm with Grob. That was actually quite funny. Hi, this is Jessica calling in my Potter pondering about Grop in the movie. He wasn't really what I pictured, but that could just be a me thing. He seemed too big to me for some reason. Like, was it the angle or the scale or, I mean, I don't know, the size of Hagrid? Who, I said. He seemed more like 50 feet tall than only 16, but again, that could just be me being weird and not knowing sizes. But he seemed too massive. <laughs> Honestly, I don't care for that storyline much in general, if I'm you know, being honest, but I really don't like that the movie made him into like a big toddler, the way he picks up Hermione and she has to scold him to be put down. Like, I just find that super cringy. Also, why is Ron jealous? It's a 50-foot tall toddler giant versus a 6-foot toddler. <laughs> Do you really think Hermione is going to like run off and marry him? Like, I don't, I don't understand that. But, like, he should have been more afraid for her safety. Yeah, but anyway, I think they would have been better actually following the book and have Ron playing Quidditch while Harry and Hermione sneak off with Hagrid. I know because there was no Quidditch in this movie for some dumbass reason that would have been odd if Ron just randomly didn't go with them, but at least that would have been a little bit closer to what happened in the book. I think Grop... I agree with Katie. I hate saying that name. It's weird and it doesn't like roll off the tongue easily, but I think it would have been better and less cheesy if they stayed on that violent route with him. The bicycle bell was kind of cute, I guess, if that's your thing, but the book version would have sooner chucked 
Hermione, like, across the forest and, like, played with her? I don't know. Also, Hagrid does use some magic when necessary, so I always just assumed he had, like, enchanted that rope so it wouldn't break. You know, rather than just, like, oh, this random rope can hold him. But, I don't know. I could be wrong. Okay, bye! Thank you so much for your responses! Our trivia question last week was... How many hours a day does Ernie claim he's averaging studying for exams? Ernie bombards classmates with questions about how many hours a day they are revising, claiming he is averaging eight, since some days it's only six, and on a weekend he can get in a good ten hours. Congratulations goes to Megan Slater! Woohoo! It has been so much fun seeing many different people winning lately. Mm Mm-hmm. But this does mark the start of a new streak since it's Megan's second week in a row. All right. Will she keep it going? We shall see. For now, let's dive into the first half of Chapter 31, OWLs, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes, even though we thought it had some. They are just so different that they mostly fit with the second half of the chapter, so we'll get to that next week. Right, the second half of the chapter and a previous chapter. Yeah. Yeah. But even though it's a four minute long movie section and I didn't do my due diligence, I realized that it didn't actually fit into this half of the chapter. And last week we said that it had corresponding film scenes and it doesn't. So can you just say do my due diligence again? Do my due diligence. (laughs) (laughs) They made. Anywho, chapter 31, OWLs part one. Ron is still so excited about somehow winning the Quidditch final that Harry and Hermione can't get a word in to tell him about Grop. Not that they are really trying, since that would be an awful wake-up call. Instead, they go out to the grounds to study, though Ron is enjoying all the praise from fellow Gryffindors. He continues to give them the play-by-play from the match, and how he finally found his confidence before saying, You saw what happened while sweeping his hair back just like James had done in the memory. When Harry asks if Cho cried after the match, Ron catches on that they had not been present, and Hermione tells him about Hagrid taking her and Harry to meet Grop. Ron is flabbergasted that Hagrid brought a giant back with him, and that he wants them to teach Grop English if he gets sacked. Hermione says they promised, but Ron says they will have to break their promise, and compares Grop to Norbert and Aragog, sarcastically pointing out how well those situations went. In the end, they just hope Hagrid doesn't get fired so it won't be a problem. June comes with great weather, but also exams. Teachers stop giving homework, and lessons are devoted to the topics most likely to come up on OWLs. Harry is focused mostly on exams, but does occasionally wonder if Lupin had ever talked to Snape about resuming Harry's occlumency lessons. If so, Snape has ignored him, and Hermione is also too focused to badger him about the lessons. Many fifth years are starting to act oddly, like Ernie who will interrogate people about how many hours they are spending studying per day. Draco seems quite confident that his father's connections with the head of the Wizarding Examinations Authority, Griselda Marchbanks, will help him breeze through his exams, though Neville says she's a friend with his gran, and he doesn't think that's actually going to help him at all, because she's a lot like her, and they saw what she's like at St. Mungo's. This is also the first time he's mentioned seeing them there, and they don't know what to say. Many students have started selling cheating aids for things like concentration, mental agility, and wakefulness to the 5th and 7th years. Ron is tempted to buy some, while Hermione confiscates things marketed as Barufio's Brain Elixir and Powdered Dragon Claw, which turns out to be dried doxy droppings. This puts an end to Harry and Ron's desire for the aids altogether. They received their timetables for the exams in their next Transfiguration class. The exams will be spread over two weeks, theory in the morning and practical in the afternoon, with the practical astronomy at night. Professor McGonagall warns them against cheating and explains some of the anti-cheating measures that have been put in place, as well as prohibited magical aids. She then says that their new headmistress plans to punish cheating most severely as the exam results will reflect upon her new regime at the school, 
though she does insist that this is no reason to not do their very best. She also says that they will get their results in July by OWL. Their first exam is to be Theory of Charms on Monday morning, and Harry agrees to test Hermione, though he regrets it almost immediately as she keeps snatching the book back to check the answers herself, finally hitting Harry in the nose with it. He stops helping her after that. Everyone is doing their best to study, Ron and Seamus included. Hermione doesn't even stop while she's eating, continually diving under the table to double-check her books for something. The examiners arrive and are being welcomed by Umbridge, who looks rather nervous. Professor Marchbanks may be slightly deaf, or is just enjoying yelling at Umbridge. She also says that she has not heard from Dumbledore lately, and asks Umbridge if she might know where he is. Umbridge has to answer that she has no idea, though she is sure the Ministry will soon track him down. Professor Marchbanks disagrees heartily, saying they won't find him if Dumbledore doesn't want to be found, and recalls his brilliance during his own exams, saying he did things with a wand she's never seen before. That night, everyone is experiencing increased nerves, and Harry has trouble studying and sleeping, regretting that he expressed his desire to be an auror now, wishing he'd said something more achievable. This continues through breakfast the next morning before they're called to their exams, while the others go off to lessons. The Great Hall is set up the same way it had been in Snape's memory, and when they're all seated, Professor McGonagall tells them all to begin. The first question reminds Harry of their fight with the troll in first year, and he smiles. After the exam, Hermione is confident, but also wants to go over some of the questions, which makes Ron insist that they are not going to go through every exam afterwards since it's bad enough doing them once. Lunch is next, then the fifth years are moved to the small room off the Great Hall to await their individual practical exams, being called alphabetically. The students do not return after, so nobody who is still waiting knows how they went. Harry is paired with Professor Tofty for exam, who asks if he is the famous Potter, which distracts Draco enough that the wine glass he is levitating falls and shatters, which makes Harry smile. The exam goes well, though he mixes up the color change and growth charms. He does manage to fix it and is glad that Hermione had not been present to see it. After that, they go right back to revising for the Transfiguration exam, which is next. The practical is better than the written for Harry, but Hannah Abbott accidentally multiplies her ferret into a flock of flamingos, causing a halt to the exam while they clear the birds out. Herbology is Wednesday and Defense Against the Dark Arts is Thursday. For the first time, Harry is sure he passed. He has no problem with the written and takes particular pleasure in acing his practical in front of Umbridge. Professor Tofty congratulates him and then asks if he might demonstrate his Patronus for a bonus point. Harry imagines Umbridge being sacked and summons a perfect Patronus, which all of the examiners watch go by. Umbridge has a nasty smile playing around her wide, slack mouth as he walks by her, but he doesn't care since he's sure he just achieved an outstanding OWL. Friday is a free day for Ron and Harry while Hermione has ancient runes, so they take a break playing a game of wizard's chess. When Hermione comes back, she's furious with herself because she mixed up a was and I was. She also tells them that someone put another Niffler in Umbridge's office and she's losing her mind about it. Ron and Harry are all for this, but Hermione angrily reminds them that she thinks Hagrid's the one doing it. She goes off to her dorm, and Ron calls her a lovely, sweet-tempered girl, though very quietly. Hermione's poor mood remains all weekend, but Harry and Ron are able to ignore it by focusing on their potions revision. Harry is nervous about this exam and knows that it will most likely be the reason he fails to become an Auror. He does struggle with the written, but thinks he got full marks from the question about Polyjuice Potion. Harry finds the practical to be much easier than usual without Snape around, and Neville also appears much happier than in any potions class. Hermione continues to be in a foul mood, and since none of the fifth years are stupid enough to engage her, she tells off some first years for giggling too loudly in the common room. Tuesday is Care of Magical Creatures, which Harry is determined to do well in to support Hagrid. 
they are asked to identify a gnarl among hedgehogs, which is easy enough by offering them milk. Since gnarls are very suspicious, they will think it's an attempt to poison them. They also have to demonstrate the correct handling of a bow truckle, clean out a fire crab without sustaining serious burns, and choose the appropriate diet for a sick unicorn. The theory exam for astronomy is on Wednesday morning, while the afternoon is devoted to divination. Harry's divination exam goes very poorly since he doesn't see anything in the crystal ball, and during the tea leaf reading, he tells Professor Marchbanks that she will be meeting a round, dark, soggy stranger. He finishes up by mixing up the life and headlines on her palm and telling her that she ought to have died the previous Tuesday. Ron makes Harry feel a little better by telling him how he told his examiner in detail about the ugly man with a wart on his nose that he saw in the crystal ball, only to look up and realize he'd been describing his examiner's reflection. Both acknowledge that they should not have taken divination to begin with, but are happy to be able to drop it after this. Hermione reports that she's done well in arithmancy, and therefore, her mood has improved. Like I said before, the movie scenes that correspond with this chapter don't really line up with this half, mostly because they kind of, but also not really, line up with a previous section of the book. So we're just going to talk about that next week. Yeah, you kind of have to. Yeah. We'll just focus on the first half of this chapter, which is actually more than half the chapters, since none of it got mentioned in the movie at all, and the movie section's kind of long to balance it out. A little less is going to go into next week, but a little more is going to go into this week to pad it out. Mm -hmm. And this was a tough one to split. Yeah. There isn't even a good cutoff. I just kind of (laughs) stopped. Sometimes that's just what you got to do. Yeah. But the chapter starts off with Ron's perspective on winning the Quidditch match, which obviously they couldn't include in the movie. Mm -hmm. And he's just kind of talking nonstop, giving them a play-by-play of everything that happened, which is good because Harry and Hermione didn't actually get to see it. They didn't see it. And it's kind of nice for Ron to finally be excited. And have that moment. He's getting a moment. But the play-by-play is now making them feel like they were there. Right. They just can't get in a word edgewise to tell him about Grop. Not that they're really trying to, because that's going to be a big bubble burster. Right. Ooh, chapter title. Or episode title. (laughs) Chapter title. Big bubble burster. Big bubble burster. So they start off in the common room, and he's super excited, and he's telling him all the stories, and he's got other people in the common room that are, like, fawning over him because Mm -hmm. this is his moment. Yeah. And it's making it really difficult for them to study, so they decide to move out to the grounds. Although... They don't actually get to study. Ron just kind of continues his play-by-play. I was going to say, they've just changed scenery. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. So he's continuing all of these play-by-plays and then like randomly gets modest and just sort of like sweeps his hair back and says, well, you saw. (laughs) (laughs) It's been like an hour of him going on and on and on about the entire every second of the match. And then to make a long story short, too late for that. Well, you saw. (laughs) Right. And also the way that he sweeps his hair back reminds Harry super strongly of his dad and kind of gives him this little moment of, aw. Because he's kind of come to terms with his dad not being perfect. uh, Right. Yeah. Although pretty far from perfect well you know aren't we all (laughs) Eh, yeah i've never held someone upside down and pants them though so give it time that is true (laughs) that is true and i don't have magic if i had magic right it probably would have happened by now easy way for me to do that i can't claim that i wouldn't have (laughs) (laughs) that is very true although considering my childhood i would have been more likely to be snape in that scenario i know what you and me both (laughs) We'd have gotten pantsed. That's just, yeah. (sighs) Moving on. Yep. Anyway, Ron finally gets his first clue that they weren't actually at the match when Harry says, I suppose Cho cried after the match. (laughs) And Ron's like, yeah, well, didn't you see her chuck her broomstick aside? And he's like, wait a minute. You did see it, didn't you? (laughs) And Harry and Hermione are just both standing there going, uh, well, I mean there is such a vague term we started off there we were there in 
spirit? And then Hermione lets the Neasel out of the bag because she confesses that Hagrid took her and Harry to go meet Grop. Who's Grop? Well, we know who Grop is. Meh. <laughs> Ron gets the whole fill in now on this aspect and mm-hmm. just bubble deflates. And he's just like, are you kidding me? Hagrid brought a giant back with him and he wants us to teach him English. The noises that you make sometimes. That's my flabbergasted voice. I, yeah. That's... I always feel that a good flabbergasted voice should be about 10 pitches higher than normal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, congrats. You did that. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> but yeah, so Ron, completely shocked by this. Sure. Cannot believe it, as Hermione said 17 times in the previous chapter. Yeah. And Hermione's just like, well, we promised. Ron <laughs> says that, well, we'll have to break the promise. I love how at no point is Ron like, I didn't promise shit. I was not there. This is a you problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he also is not going to leave them high and dry. He's going to try and talk him out of it, which he does, because he reminds them what happened with Norbert and what happened with Aragog. Yeah. And in the end, they just kind of end up hoping that maybe he won't get fired and then it won't be a problem. It's already a problem. It's a fucking problem. Oh, my God. And that was a pretty short little introduction to the chapter. It then basically launches right into it's now June. The weather's getting nicer, but the exams are also approaching. So it's like good news, bad news. Mm Mm-hmm. Sure. On the plus side, good news, bad news, the teachers stop giving them homework. However, their lessons are also now completely based on what's most likely to come up on the exam. So no homework, lots of studying. I would rather have the homework. Yeah. This takes up most of Harry's focus, you know, preparing for these exams that Mm kind of determine his future, especially since he wants to be an Auror and has decent potential at failing it because of how he's doing in a couple of his classes and the relationship he has with one of those teachers and speaking of that one teacher he does in the back of his head occasionally wonder if Lupin ever went to talk to Snape about Harry resuming those occlumency lessons Mm -hmm. and figures if he did Snape completely ignored it because they have not started back up but I would also like to remind Harry that he was supposed to go to Snape and be like, we're supposed to keep doing this Dumbledore wants. Right. And he clearly <laughs> did not do that and was just like, I'll wait to see what Lupin does. Yeah. I'm That's, busy. <laughs> sir. Sir, I can't help but feel like you didn't really try. No, he did not. No. On the plus side, Hermione is so focused on studying for exams that she doesn't have time to badger him about it as well. So he's mostly getting away with this Mm -hmm. but with all of that added pressure from exams everyone is starting to act a little bit weird yeah ernie in particular is one of the ones who practically jumps out of nowhere at people how many hours a day are you studying (laughs) what would you say you average i mean i'm averaging about eight which was our trivia question it sure was i just saw how i imagine him being really frantic about it yeah I just feel like it's this really feverish, like, I'm doing all of this. I'm not getting any sleep. What are you doing? Yeah. Ernie's slap happy. Yeah. Like, consistently slap happy, I think. And I really would have liked to see that frantic aspect of the exams. They didn't include a lot of details about the actual exams. Yeah. Other things that are not helping with the pressure on this at all is Draco implying that the relationship his father has with the Wizarding Examinations Authority, Griselda Marchbanks, is going to help him do well on the exams. And he's making comments about how, well, of course, if it's who you know that matters, people like Potter don't have a chance. Uh... And even though he's kind of making that as a dig at Potter, anybody else who hears him is going to be like, my dad doesn't know who Griselda Marchbanks is. I'm going to fail this. This is going to be terrible. We're all going to suck. I'm gonna, uh, uh. Which I'm sure he's not like upset about. Probably I'm sure not. he's not like, oh, I didn't mean you. No, he's like, yeah, all you bitches. Yeah. Because I'm the only one who's cool enough to have my nepotism going. And it's <clears throat> fucking yeah. I'm Draco. Fucking Nazi von Duschbeck II. And I know people because my father knows people (laughs) fuck this kid yeah sorry i (laughs) tell me how you really feel (laughs) (laughs) this might be a sore spot for me i'm not sure imagine that (laughs) on the plus side neville's gran also knows griselda marchbanks 
And he's able to say, yeah, I don't know if that's really a thing because she's actually really good friends with my gran. In fact, they're kind of a lot alike. And you met her at St. Mungo's. You know what she's like. I don't know that knowing her is going to help me at all. If anything, it might hurt me because of all of the shit my gran says about me to her. Yeah. That's also kind of proving Draco's point, though. (laughs) Is like if you have someone who's saying not necessarily good things about you to Griselda Marchbanks. True. Then you would do badly. Yeah. Whereas Draco is saying he's got people saying good things and he's got good connections. It's not necessarily just them knowing him. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just spitting bullshit now. Bull spit. Bull- <laughs> yes, bull spit. <laughs> Neville also points out that despite Griselda Marchbanks and his grand being good friends, he's never once heard her mention Lucius Malfoy. <laughs> so he doesn't even know how well he could actually know her anyway. But Right. This is also the very first time that he's even brought up the fact that they did run into him and his gran at St. Mungo's. So despite the whole conversation that they're having, they don't really know what to say. They're just kind of standing there going, uh, Mm -hmm. do we acknowledge this or, but you know, pressure of the exams, it just sort of glosses over back to stress. There's a lot of things on their minds. And it is really stressful to the point that, Students are trying to take advantage of that. I should say non-testing students are trying to take advantage of that by selling cheating aids. Mm -hmm. Things that are supposed to help concentration and mental agility and wakefulness. I think we call that coke. I'm pretty sure it's mostly the six years targeting the fifth years and the seventh years. Yeah. Ron actually considers buying some. And Hermione basically talks him out of it, especially since she mentions that she confiscated something that a sixth year, I assume, had marketed as Barufio's brain elixir and some powdered dragon claw. But it just turned out to be dried doxy droppings. So somebody was literally selling shit. Ew. As a brain elixir, something that's supposed to help make you smarter. I think you'd be smarter once you found out what it really was and never fucking touched it again. You definitely would learn something from it, that's for sure. (laughs) But thanks to Hermione, Harry and Ron get to just learn from her. Yeah. And they stop trying to buy these aids altogether. They're just like, okay, we'll just stick with normal studying. We'll just pick Hermione's brain. Right? Although... Maybe a brain elixir would actually work because Hermione is kind of skeptical about things that are literally magic. Yeah, if it's not in a book, it's not real almost. And I mean, there could be like new products out on the shelves and things like that. Well, there's literally a potion that can make you think you've fallen in love with somebody. Why wouldn't there be a potion that could make you focus better? Or make you remember things better? Or help you sleep? Like why? Or help you stay awake? Yeah. Magic Adderall. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Matterall. So the fact that she's just like, none of these actually work does seem like another one of those close minded Hermione things. Yeah. However. But dried doxy droppings. Yeah. That's when it comes to be a problem. What's real? What's not? Yeah. And there's probably a lot of snake oil out there. Oh, for sure. You know what I mean? Especially since it's the sixth years peddling it. Yeah. Maybe some precocious fourth years. Sure. But they haven't experienced this yet, so they don't yet know to take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. I feel exactly. like it's the fifth years that made it through their OWLs that are now six years that are just like... They know how desperate you get. Yep. Yeah. I can sure. make a buck off this shit. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Know your audience. Right? <laughs> That's what Fred and George did. And they did. Mm -hmm. Except their stuff was, you know, tested at least. And they didn't try to peddle it before it was ready. Yeah, exactly. But moving on. Yes. So then they all receive their timetables for how the exam schedule is going to go in their next transfiguration class. It's going to take them two weeks. And for the most part, they do the theory of the test in the morning and then the practical in the afternoon. Mm hmm. But then they had to put the practical for astronomy at night. Since Obviously. you have to be able to see yeah. the night sky. Kind of important. Right. McGonagall gives him this nice big speech about cheating and everything that's been put in place to help prevent them. So they can't do it and what will happen if they do and what magical aids are prohibited from the exam. Like you can't have spell correcting ink or spell checking quills or whatever they all are, you know? Yeah. All of those fun little things that exist. 
Remember, too, it was the 90s where you couldn't use a calculator in math class because the teacher was always like, you're not always going to have a calculator with you. And now we all fucking have calculators with us at all times. Right. <laughs> and I would much rather know that I'm doing the calculation correctly if I have a serious job involving math. Like, you don't want right? those NASA people to fuck the math up because they didn't use a calculator. Exactly. I'm cool with you using a calculator, right? guy. It is more so like that now. We don't need long division in NASA. <laughs> just, just calculate that shit, guy. But then McGonagall has this line that I love, mostly because it's McGonagall in well, yeah. every line that she has I love. <laughs> but this is another one of her sassy ones mm -hmm. where she admits that the new headmistress is planning on punishing cheating severely because the exam results are going to reflect upon her new regime at the school. Ah. And she follows this up by saying, however, that is no reason to not do your very best. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fuck it up just because of that, guys. And then she tells them that they're going to get their results in July by Owl. Mm -hmm. You know what's funny to me is this entire chapter reads like a fucking montage it would have gone so well in the movie as a montage the movie doesn't do montages though Ellen. the movie is a fucking montage katie <laughs> oh yeah oh, like yeah. they could have just given us a little montage of them sitting in different exams or doing the practical yeah well and it could have been five minutes and i would have been so happy they don't love us Ellen. they don't they just don't <sighs> Because now we're going into their first exam, which is the Theory of Charms, Monday morning. Mm -hmm. And before it, Harry agrees that he'll test Hermione and then he almost immediately regrets this because even though she'll say the answer and he'll tell her that's right, she doesn't believe him and will take <laughs> the book back to confirm with her own eyes. Well, because only the book is right. And it gets to the point where one of the times she snatches the book from him, she hits him in the nose with it. <laughs> and he's just like, that's enough. I'm not helping you anymore. I'd peace out right about then, too. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she just goes on to studying on her own. And everybody is studying, even Ron and Seamus. Mm -hmm. Hermione doesn't even really stop to eat. She's sitting at the table, still, like, going over things in her notes. Like, she might have food in front of her. I don't know if she's actually eating it or not, but she cannot focus on that. Yeah. Because she keeps diving back under the table to look something up in the book to make sure she doesn't forget it. And it's just like this constant like disappear under the table, come back up, disappear under the table, come back up, like just freaking out completely. She is stressed AF. If she weren't studying, we'd be nervous as to what she was actually doing. You'd be nervous. <laughs> I'd be proud. Let's be honest. <laughs> When the examiners arrive, which I assume is the night before, so this must be Sunday night. Sure. Umbridge welcomes them. She looks rather nervous. Honestly, not that I feel bad for her, mm -hmm. but not having any idea how to be a headmistress or a teacher or anything like this at all, this has got to be really fucking intimidating. Yeah. And it serves her fucking right for putting herself in this situation, but... I say, you love to see it. Yeah. You just do. And I am kind of disappointed that we didn't get to see her out of sorts. Mm -hmm. She deserved to have scenes where she was out of sorts because they were enjoyable for us. Yeah. And as we talked about before, too, in the movie, there were so many scenes of people backing off from her. Yeah. There wasn't enough pushback. No. Nope. By the other adults, especially. No. Nope. And we could have really used that. Yeah. And in lieu of that, we could have really used this, where we see that, like... She's bitten off more than she can chew. Yeah, she's fucking up. Like, we see it, but it's not until it gets to such a point. Right. That is insane. Like, it would have been really nice to see her stressing over this. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, and we'll get to this later, but the only time we see her with the OWLs, she's just sitting there prim and proper. Oh, yeah, she's she just fine. AF. Yeah, she's just calm as fuck. And that's not what we have here. No, it is not. And it's just sad. And then what makes this little scene extra entertaining that I also would have liked to see is Professor Marchbanks, Griselda Marchbanks, mm -hmm. is either a little bit deaf and talks very loudly. Sure. Or she's just talking loudly because she enjoys shouting at Pepto-Bitch Mall. Why not both? Right? <laughs> and I just think that's kind of fun. 
It's like the one park ranger in Parks and Rec, uh, played by Andy Samberg, who's like shouting everything. And you don't know if it's because he's hard of hearing or if he just fucking shouts everything at all times. It's kind of like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. One of the things that she shouts is something about how she hasn't heard from Dumbledore lately. And she wonders if Pepto Bitch Mall might know where he is. <laughs> and Pepto Bitch Mall has to admit that she doesn't. Yeah, she has she has zero fucking clue. But she does try to say that she's sure the ministry is going to track him down soon. And Marchbanks just yells, not if Dumbledore doesn't want to be found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's us just going, are they though? Mm-hmm. And she also mentions his own brilliance because she was his examiner. That's how old this woman is. Yeah. She is old enough to have examined Dumbledore's in his fifth year. That's old. Yeah. That's old AF. But she says that he did things with his wand that she's never seen before. I see that look on your face. It may be both, but like magic things. Not getting any better. No. Nope. Let's just keep moving. <laughs> So then when everyone tries to go to bed that night, it's a struggle because they're all so nervous. Oh, yeah. Freaking out. Harry can barely sleep, can't focus on studying. And he's just like, why did I say I wanted to be an or? I should have never said that. Why didn't right. I say I wanted to be something more achievable? Why didn't I say I wanted to be Stan Shunpike? Like, just... <laughs> 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 And then this whole sentiment just continues right through breakfast on Monday morning before their first exam. And everybody else goes off to their lessons, but the fifth years and probably the seventh years, too, since they're doing their NEWTs, Mm -hmm. they stay behind in the Great Hall waiting to be called to their exams. Yeah. I guess that it's just the entire fifth years and seventh years taking whatever exam they need to take all at once in the Great Hall because they just mentioned that it's set up the way it had been in Snape's memory. Yeah. So I don't know if maybe the NEWTs have a slightly different schedule or how that's done because that one kind of implied that it was only OWLs. Yeah. Interesting to think how that might have been. I mean, NEWTs are never even mentioned in the movie. So True. There's that. That's not a thing. <laughs> yeah. What? That's an animal. Yeah. (laughs) And a test in the wizarding world. Not in in the the books. (laughs) Not today, Ellen. No. Not today. But like I said, the Great Hall is set up the same way, Mm -hmm. which is with a whole bunch of individual desks all facing forward. Mm -hmm. And they all take their seat in these desks. And Professor McGonagall just says, okay, start. So it's not even Pepto Bitch Mall overseeing it. It's McGonagall. Yeah. I mean, she's probably there, right? Probably. I don't know how that works exactly. Either way, it's not her who starts the test. Yeah. She's not sitting up there lording over them all while they do it. Yeah. On the plus side, for Harry, he feels pretty good starting off this first test because the very first question Makes him think about their fight with the troll in his first year. And he's just like, oh, I know this one. I've experienced it. (laughs) So he actually smiles. And I think that's a good way to start a test with a smile. Right? It's like a genuine one. Yeah. I imagine most of Harry's answers are going to be more like, oh, I've done this before. (laughs) As opposed to, oh, I remember reading about this. Right? (laughs) Hey, wait, I did this when I meddled that one time. That narrows it down. (laughs) (laughs) Then after the exam, Hermione is feeling very confident, but she wants to discuss some of the questions. Mm -hmm. And Ron finally just has to go, no, we are not taking the exam twice. (laughs) (laughs) It's bad enough doing them once. Right? God, Hermione. But yeah, so they get lunch after the exam. Mm -hmm. And then after lunch... They go to a small room right off the Great Hall to wait to do their practical exams. And they just get called alphabetically. But then they're dismissed out a different door. So they don't even go back through that room. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows how it goes for the previous students. And they just have to sit there and wait their turn through the alphabet and wonder. Yeah, they take that shit seriously, man. And for this one in particular, they're paired with a guest professor essentially Mm -hmm. and it's just one-on-one where that professor tells them what they want to see and see how well they do it yeah so harry is paired with somebody named professor tofty 
Okay. Who immediately sees his name and is like, are you the Harry Potter? Of course. I'm a Harry Potter. <laughs> right? Because there's so many of us. I don't know if I'm the Harry Potter. I mean. And this is both awkward and satisfying for Harry. Mm-hmm. Awkward because, yeah, I'm that Harry Potter. Right? <laughs> and satisfying because it distracts Draco to the point that he loses concentration on his levitating charm and causes the wine glass to shatter. Ha ha, suck it, Nazi von douchebag the second. So he actually gets to start this part of the exam with a smile, too. So far, so good, really. Yeah. And he feels like that it overall went pretty well. Mm -hmm. His one real mistake was mixing up the color change charm with the growth charm. And he was supposed to be turning a rat orange, which is fun. It mm -hmm. probably wasn't sunshine, daisies, no, right. butter, nothing rhymes with orange. Turn this stupid fat rat orange. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of turning it orange, he just kind of swelled it up to about the size of a badger. That is not a rat I want to see. No. No. However, he did manage to fix it in the end and actually turn the rat orange. So. Well, that's good. I feel like. Maybe he lost some points there, but he still did it. So it wasn't full marks, but it was decent. Yeah. He was really grateful that Hermione wasn't there to witness this <laughs> and, you know, kind of forgot to tell her about it after the fact. But he felt perfectly comfortable telling Ron because Ron was supposed to turn a dinner plate, enlarge it or something. I don't know what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to do something with the dinner plate mm -hmm. that wasn't mutating it into a giant mushroom. And that is what he did do. Ah, and yes. he had no idea how he did it, couldn't figure out how to reverse it, was just like, here is my large mushroom. <laughs> so that kind of made Harry feel a little bit better. And he was like, oh, yeah, don't feel bad. I totally did this. So, Well, yeah, because, I mean, if you want to talk about ways you fucked up your test, you talk about it with Ron. Right. You commiserate. Yeah, exactly. You don't throw yourself under the bus to look like an idiot. Yeah. You don't tell Hermione. I mean, she's already sitting there probably freaking out about not using the correct exact swish to do right? something and freaking out over it. Oh, wait till you hear what she freaks out about. Mm -hmm. On the plus side, it's just that. Written, practical, time to study. So then they get to go study for Transfiguration because that was their next exam. Mm -hmm. I think he felt like it went pretty well. And then when they had the practical in the afternoon, he felt even better about that. Mm-hmm. At least Harry did. Yeah. Hannah Abbott managed to multiply her ferret into a flock of flamingos. It could have been worse. I suppose, but they still had to stop exams for about 10 minutes so they could <laughs> capture and remove the birds. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit of drama during that one. A little bit, sure. On Wednesday, they had Herbology. Mm -hmm. On Thursday, they had Defense Against the Dark Arts. And this one, finally, Harry's just like, I definitely passed this. Yeah. He's like, Fuck y'all. I got this. Mm -hmm. No problems with the written whatsoever. And felt a pretty particular pleasure in doing all of the spells that he wasn't allowed to do in class right in front of right Pecto Bitmar. Right in Bitmar. front of her. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he had Professor Tofty again for this one who was like, oh, well done. Well done. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard through the grapevine <laughs> that you can produce a Patronus, which this is like double little knife yeah. to Pepto Bitch Mom because doesn't matter how impressive the magic is if he's not supposed to be doing magic outside of school. Exactly. But he tells him that if he demonstrates his Patronus, he can get a bonus point. Fuck yeah, I'm gonna do that. So Harry lifts his wand, imagines Pepto Bitch Mom getting fucking fired <laughs> and sends his stag galloping across the hall which causes everyone to stop what they're doing and just stare mm -hmm. you know he's just kind of gloating oh yeah and feeling like the big man on campus yeah pepto yeah. bitch mall does give him kind of a nasty little smile and i'm not entirely sure why mm. i don't know why she'd be gloating in that moment maybe she thinks that he just made her look good probably honestly yeah I was like, oh, yeah, I taught him everything he knows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. That's me. All because of my teachings this year. Mm -hmm. yes. Or not. 
or not at all because of my teachings this year. Exactly. Yeah. Which is actually kind of disappointing because everybody that is in the DA does pretty well on the exams. Mm -hmm. And Harry does kind of like look around where they're all doing the practical and feels some pride about that, knowing like I taught them. But it yeah. is totally giving credit to her. It is. Definitely. And so I think you're right. I think that might be what that nasty little smile is. But he kind of doesn't care because he is 99.99999% that he just got an outstanding. Yeah. I'd say 100%, but he's hairy and he's a little pessimistic. Well, you got to stay humble. Right. Yeah. So Friday ends up being a free day for Harry and Ron because it's the day for ancient runes and they're not in that class. Mm -hmm. Hermione has an exam. They do not. But since the weekend is right after that, because, you know, the weekend follows Fridays, what? they decide, right? They decide that they deserve a break. Yeah. So while Hermione's taking her exam, they're playing a game of wizard's chess. Sure. And when she comes back, she is pissed because she mixed up the word a was with the word I was. And just to give you the visual of this, a was is spelled E H W A Z. And I was is spelled E-I-H-W-A-Z. So she literally left out the letter I. What is she, stupid? Right? Jeez, Hermione. And I have to wonder how strict spelling is on something like that for ancient runes. And those words being too similar I was to say, one I've... another, are they two different words that mean something completely different? That's what I was going to say. Like, if they're two totally different things, if it changes everything she was going to say probably a pretty big fuck up but if it's just something where like you know it was just a you letter left this. out yeah it was is just that a... actually gonna hurt her yeah who knows who the hell knows but then to make this stress worse she also tells them that she just heard that somebody put another niffler in pepto bitch mall's office and pepto bitch mall is losing her shit <laughs> Again, couldn't have happened to a nicer lady. Which is basically Ron and Harry's reaction too. But then Hermione's just like, um, hello. She thinks Hagrid's the one doing this and we don't want him fired. Mm-hmm. That's a valid point. Yeah. From there, she immediately marches away and Ron just says, she's such a lovely, sweet-tempered girl, isn't she? Hmm. I'm Ron. <laughs> <laughs> And that's basically how Hermione's mood stays all weekend. Luckily, it's not that difficult to ignore because they're all so caught up in their studying and their next exam is potions. And nobody's looking forward to that shit. Yeah. So naturally, considering the teacher, mm -hmm. considering the subject, and considering the fact that this is the one subject that could fuck up everything for Harry's goal of becoming an Auror. Stakes are pretty high. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. He did find the written to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Though he felt very confident in his answer for the question about polyjuice potion. <laughs> he was able to describe the effects of polyjuice potion with pretty strong accuracy. Gee, I wonder why. Right? Huh. I love it. All of his meddling mm -hmm. probably really helped him on this so much. Oh, yeah. However, the practical... He found really easy because Snape wasn't around to breathe down his neck or treat him like shit. And even Neville looks happier doing the potions exam. Yeah. How much do you want to bet that's why Snape only takes students with outstandings? Yeah, probably. Because he's like, well, you guys got it easy on the test because I wasn't there. Yeah, probably. <laughs> So I'm only taking A plus pluses, motherfuckers. A plus 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 pluses pluses pluses. Mm hmm O pluses. Because there is no excuse <laughs> for you to fuck this up because you had it easy as fuck. Right. Which, yay. Yay, indeed. <laughs> Hermione's bad mood continues. Hmm. None of the fifth years are stupid enough to engage with her, though. So she kind of ends up taking it out on some first years and just yells at them for giggling too loudly in the common room. <laughs> Like, she was looking for a fight. And yeah. the 50s are all like, nope, I'm just studying. <laughs> it's a little bit like after the Yule Ball, where she's like, go to bed, both of you. And they're just like, shit, okay. We were. Fuck. <laughs> then on Tuesday, they have their Care of Magical Creatures exams. And Harry is like, I'm going to do well on this and support a Hagrid. You can't mm -hmm. fire him. He taught us. Yeah. They were asked to identify the gnarl among a bunch of hedgehogs. 
That has to be really cute. Right. And apparently <laughs> the way you do this is by offering them all a bowl of milk in turn because gnarls are very suspicious creatures and they're going to think that you poison them. So when you get to the gnarl with the milk, they freak out. And that's how you know it's a gnarl. Babies are cute. I know, right? Oh my gosh. I love little suspicious aminals. Aminals. Yeah. They had to demonstrate how to correctly handle a bow truckle, which we know they learned. Mm-hmm. And because of Fantastic Beasts, we know what bow truckles look like. Yeah. And those are even cuter. Yeah. <laughs> they had to clean out a fire crab without getting majorly burned. That sounds dirty. Of course it does. <laughs> And then they also had to pick the appropriate diet for a sick unicorn. So most of this stuff we know is things that he actually learned from Hagrid. Yeah. Like some of it was with Grubbly Plank, like the bow truckles. I want to mm. say she started that lesson and then moved on to the unicorns and Hagrid picked it up from there when he came back. Yeah. But for the most part, this is all Hagrid. Yeah. Who did a really good job teaching them because he felt good about this one. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure as far as the fire crabs go, the burns was probably a big part of that lesson. Yeah. (laughs) And they had to deal with scroots too. So Mm -hmm. they've gotten used to avoiding fire. Yes. I think he prepared them for way worse. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) They also had their theory exam for astronomy Wednesday morning. But then the afternoon was devoted to divination. And I don't know that the written exam for divination is going to be as extensive as some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. Because it's more about the doing and the reading and stuff. Yeah. I'm sure that it was there. But it sounds like they had both these in the afternoon. Or maybe there was only practical for divination. Maybe. Because it says the afternoon was devoted to divination. Mm. And he felt like it went poorly. Yeah. Yeah. Because he couldn't see anything in the crystal ball. During the tea leaf reading, he was with Professor Marchbanks, and he told her that she would be meeting a round, dark, soggy stranger. I hate it when my strangers are soggy. Right? Must have been a rainy day. Must have been. And then he rounded this exam off by mixing up the life and headlines on her palm and telling her that she should have died the previous Tuesday. (laughs) He did go through all those years with Trelawney making up his own deaths. It was just instinctual to tell somebody when they were going to die. Basically, yeah. I really hope that doesn't mean that she's going to die like next Tuesday or something. Right? Because she's old. She examined Dumbledore in his fifth year. She did. I mean, you can't live forever. No. You'd think that he would be better at BSing these, considering that's how he got through the entire class. But maybe with the pressure of it. Yeah. And it's different when it's not Trelawney or friends. Yeah. You don't really know what to expect, I think. It's true. But Harry wasn't feeling great about this exam until he talked to Ron, and that made him feel a little bit better because Ron, as it turns out, described this ugly man with a wart on his nose (laughs) that he was seeing inside his crystal ball, only to look up and realize it was an examiner's reflection. Awkward. (laughs) Don't say mole. I said mole. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, at this point, they're like, you know what? We probably shouldn't have taken this class anyway, so at least we can give it up now. Right? And that was probably the extent of them being upset about that. Of all the classes for them to bomb, this is probably the best one. (laughs) Yeah. And then Hermione returns from her arithmancy exam and says that she's done really well. So now her mood has much improved. And I decided to cut it off here because it was a high note. Makes sense to me. And nothing that happens in the next part happened in the movie anyway. Yeah. (laughs) Until you get to the very, like, last paragraph of the (laughs) chapter. (laughs) Because why? Yeah. We'll line it up as best as possible. It's all Mm -hmm. we can do. And considering there was no movie scenes, there were no actors, of course. So we'll just move right on to our Potter pondering, which is, do you think the movie should have included more details about the OWLs? I do. I know But I want to know what you think. (laughs) Well, not you. I do too. I want to know what you think, listeners. Fourth wall break. Keepers, (laughs) yes. Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Don't forget, you can also stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. 
There's no Sorting Hat story again this week, but we're still accepting them if you want to send yours in. Of course. You can email it to us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, who had actually been putting the Nifflers in Umbridge's office? The first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word, hashtag, my bad, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on patreon.com slash foxsakepod. $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channel, virtual hangouts, and more. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated, even if it's just telling your Harry Potter friends about us. And if you don't have any Harry Potter friends, there's another reason to join our Patreon, because you will meet some of the best Harry Potter people ever. I mean, just the best people ever, really. There's that too. Period. End of sentence. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 31, OWLs, and the film scenes that kind of correspond, as well as kind of correspond with an earlier chapter, too. Whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. And in the meantime... Keep calming Harry on! Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, for fuck's sake.